Hello, I'm Simon Kennan, editor of Interventional Cardiology Review, and I'm here at EuroPCR 2015 with Nicholas van Meegen to talk about the Claret Cerebral Protection Device, which is used during TAVI procedures. Nicholas, thank you very much for coming along. Um, you've had some great papers out recently about what's found in the filter devices uh, and what predicts what's found. Could you take us through some of that data? Sure. So first of all, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think um, cerebral embolization is, a hot, is still a hot topic in transcatheter aortic valve implantation. And we started our endeavor with the embolic protection devices in 2012. And uh, we came up uh, with the idea that, well, why, why would we not protect the brain in all our patients? So in 2012, we started to use embolic protection in all our patients. But after the procedure, we saved the filters and we sent them to pathology. In the beginning of that experience, we only looked at the filters and sent the filters with microscopic debris in it. We sent that to pathology and the results were amazing. So we did find microscopic debris in up to 75% of the patients. And the debris could be either thrombus or thrombotic material or real tissue. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of a surprise to us that we, that we did find so much tissue because we, the tissue amount was uh, over 50% of the patients had tissue. And you can imagine if there is thrombus embolizing to the brain, our body is used to deal with traumas. It, it can dissolve again, but tissue it will stay there for the end of time. So that was a, that was a, a quite a striking uh, finding, but it was also on par with MRI data because also by MRI after TAVI, we know that up to 80 to 85 percent of the TAVI patients will have new brain lesions if you would do an MRI of their brain. Yeah, exactly. So what is predicting arrival of tissue and thrombus in these uh, meshes? Yeah, so this is exactly what we uh, presented uh, earlier uh, today at the PCR meeting. Um, so what we did was we extended our experience and we studied 80, 83 patients. And we also um, made an adjustment to our uh, methods we no longer looked at the filters, we sent all the filters to pathology. Mm -hmm. By doing this, we increased the number of patients having tissue or having debris in those filters to 90%. So I think it's fair to say that almost all patients will have some kind of embolization during a procedure. Mm -hmm. Then we looked, okay, but what was this? What was this? Was this tissue or was it thrombus? And, and it was tissue in 65% of the patients. So two-thirds of all patients undergoing TAVI have some kind of tissue debris mm. in the filters if we protect the extracranial vessels. So then the next question was, okay, where is this tissue coming from? And it turned out to be myocardial tissue. It turned out to be pieces of the valve, the aortic valve. It could also be atherosclerotic material coming from the aorta mm. or the great vessels. And we did find fragments of delivery catheters which is quite interesting, yeah. yeah. Then what, so it was two thirds of the patients. And then the next question was, okay, is there a difference between devices? It turned out that there was a difference. There was tissue in two thirds of all the patients treated with balloon expandable systems, mm -hmm. as compared to 50% of the patients treated with self-expanding systems. So that was remarkable. And if we did some multivariate analysis, again, the balloon expandable system turned out to be a predictor mm -hmm. for tissue embolization as was oversizing. So the more you oversize, the higher the risk of finding pieces of tissue in those filters. Mm -hmm. I do have to say that there are some limitations to this study. It was a relative small sample size, so only 83 patients were enrolled. Mm -hmm. And the confidence uh, intervals were large for the, for the valve type. Okay. Not for the oversizing, but for the valve type it was. Okay. So it is definitely an hypothesis. And was this with Sapien 3 or with XT? No, it was with Sapien XT. So okay. it, it was uh, our experience up to early 2014. And as you know, Sapien 3 was launched in 2014. And we did some additional changes since then. For instance, we no longer do balloon dilatation yeah. in, our, in our procedures. Back then, it was balloon dilatation and all. And balloon dilatation predicts tissue as well? Um, we don't know because we did balloon dilatation in all those patients right, that okay. were enrolled in that uh, study, but post dilatation trended to be associated with tissue embolization. Okay, yes. all right. 
So, what's the significance of the tissue and the MRI lesions? Clearly it's not good. I guess the question is how bad is it? Yeah, so that is, that is one of the hot topics at the moment. How do we need to interpret these data? Is it, is it that bad or doesn't it mean anything? We don't know. So this is where other studies and further research is crucial. And probably it will be difficult to find um, uh, an impact of embolic protection in clinical events. But what about these subclinical events? And there are some reasons to believe from the literature that these subclinical infarcts do play a role down the stretch. Maybe not immediately, but they are linked to premature dementia, mm -hmm. to neurocognitive deficit and other issues. Why do you say it won't protect against overt clinical events? Well, I don't say it won't protect. I say it is, it's going to be difficult to demonstrate it because the stroke rate is, so, is okay. actually relatively low. Yeah, and yeah. it's definitely okay. not higher as compared to surgery. That is for sure. Yeah. Okay. So coming back to surgery, how frequently are we seeing MRI lesions after conventional aortic valve surgery? Yeah. It turns out to be 50, 50 in between 50 and 60 percent. Right. So basically it is something that also surgeons have to have to face. Okay. But so far they were not interested in that kind of studies. But now they are looking for it and we are looking for it for them. And then you see that they also have cerebral embolization. Right. But that's only 50 to 60 yeah. percent. Okay. And are these the same sorts of MRI lesions? Bigger, smaller? Yeah. So the volume of those lesions tend to be bigger. And it makes sense because I think uh, what the surgeon does is maybe a little bit more drastic and dramatic than working with catheters. In principle, a catheter-based therapy should be less invasive and should be a little bit more elegant. And how much do we think the increased num percentage of patients with lesions is due to the fact that TAVI patients are older, frailer, blah, 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 and how much of it is inherent in the procedure? Do we have a feel for that? I think that's a very, very good question. Um, is it inherent to the procedure or is it inherent to the patient we're treating nowadays? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a little bit similar to the pacemaker uh, topic. I think the patients we're treating nowadays are elderly patients. The mean age in our uh, patient population was uh, above 80. Mm. So those are the octogenarians, they have more calcium, they have more diseased uh, conduction systems. Mm -hmm. So they are more prone to dislodgement and, and to um, yeah, disturbances, conduction disturbances, I think. So how this will translate into a younger patient population or a lower risk patient population, that remains to be seen. And I think that is exactly one of the conclusions of the paper. We need further research and it's, it's definitely needed. Okay. So the Claret device, um, do you know its full name? It's the Sentinel by Claret. So Claret is the company, right. Sentinel is the device. Sentinel is the device. Sentinel. Okay. Um, so, clean TAVI, the paper, um, do you know the data? Yeah. Do you want to just take us through it? Yeah, so the clean TAVI data was for the first time presented um, at TCT last year. Yeah. It's a study that was done by uh, Axel Linke in Leipzig and they randomized 100 patients uh, one to one to the use of the claret versus no claret and they did a whole battery of testing including MRIs at baseline immediate at, at day two, two, at day seven, and then at one month, at three months. So they had, a, they had a whole battery of MRIs, but they also did neurological assessment before and after the procedure. And there was also a neurocognitive testing. So this, uh, at this uh, EuroPCR meeting, they also presented uh, some data from the neurocognitive testing. But I think the essential um, key learnings from that study are that, first of all, there was um, there were lesions in almost all patients mm -hmm. if, you did an, if you do the MRI, mm -hmm. but if you use filters you see a reduction in the number of lesions mm -hmm. and also in the volume of lesions. So there were also some, some signs of effect um, related to clinical neurological signs, for instance ataxia was more frequent in the group of patients that were not treated with the claret. But I think that the main finding is that when you use a filter-based embolic protection, you will reduce the number and the volume of the lesions in the brain. Okay. And from memory, fluoroscopy was longer, but there was no more contrast used. Yeah. So 
Um, so the fluoroscopy um, was longer, but I must say that this is no longer the case in my practice. Okay. So I have a very low threshold of using these filters because I'm a believer. I think there is a reason uh, to protect the brain during those TAVI procedures. And it takes, uh, takes me less than uh, two minutes to introduce uh, a filter. And you go in with a six French sheath, it's right radial access. Mm -hmm. You have one delivery system for two filters. So it's, it's relatively straightforward, um, but of course there are some limitations. You don't protect the left vertebral, for instance. Um, you may risk scratching some atherosclerotic plaques as you are deploying the filters, mm -hmm. but I don't think that um, additional radiation or contrast should be limitations of this uh, technology. And what's the learning curve? Again, a very relevant question, and it depends on uh, your expertise as an interventional cardiologist. If you are used to radial access, then there is no, the, the learning curve is very, very steep. So I do, um, in my coronary cases, I use a radial approach in over 90% of the cases. Also, all my studies are radial. So then the learning curve is very steep. Then the only thing that you need to learn is how to, how to make the bend of the catheter, but it's just turning a knob. It's very okay. easy. So you say you have a low threshold for using cerebral protection. What sort of percentage of TAVI cases are, are you yeah. using it for? I think uh, close to 85% of our cases now okay. are being done with the filters. So how do you decide who not to use it for? Well, I think um, when you go for an alternative access, it becomes maybe a little bit uh, more cumbersome to use yeah. the device, especially yeah. if you go for a right subclavian, that's a no-go, it's non-compatible with the, with the filter-based embolic protection that we're using today. For left uh, subclavian approach, which is our second alternative access, I do believe that as you cross the aortic arc, it may interfere with the filter mm. that is yeah. deployed. So. Um, we don't use it for subclavians and for the transapical access it's more logistic issue. You know, the organization of the room during the procedure that yeah, limits yeah. Uh, the use of the device. Okay. Nicholas, thank you very much. It was my great pleasure.